Coming up today on Houston Life as we commemorate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a TSU professor shares the impact MLK had on her generation and the work still left to do in our communities. Plus, a look at the rich history behind the first black missionary Baptist church in Houston built by freed slaves. Then sharing Dr. King's legacy with younger generations, the conversations we should be having with our children to inspire hope and change. And we're catching up with Lauren Anderson, a local icon who was one of the first African-American principal ballerinas. All of that and more happening today on Houston Life. Live from Studio B and KPRC2. Houston Life starts now. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Houston Life on this Monday, January 17th, 2022. I'm Derek Shore. And I'm Courtney Savala, of course, along with Lauren Kelly and Joe Sam. Our crew is together here in studio today. We are. We're assembled. <laughs> well, exactly. it's great to be here together. Mm -hmm. And normally we do this just on special occasions. So on this MLK Day, we are honoring the life and legacy, of course, of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And there's been so much conversation in preparation for this day. And I I often think back to growing up as a young person mm -hmm. in Salt Lake City, Utah, where, you know, I, I feel like I was done a disservice, right? And yeah. I think so many young people, we grow up feeling like history, oh, well, that was so long ago. It doesn't apply today. But it feels like now the lessons of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. are perhaps more relevant mm -hmm. than ever. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Since his passing in 1968 at the Lorraine Motel back in Memphis, Tennessee, we wouldn't have been able to do this, all sit up here together and be able to do a TV show. So it's surprising and it's rewarding and honoring all in the same time to be able to realize the history that has come and where we are right now. Still, there's, of course, so much more that we can do. I mean, there's a lot that's happening right now that would have not made him very pleased with the work that he's done, but I still say we've done so much and we've come so far because now we're able to do this. So Stacey Dash, who is one of the actresses, I'm pretty sure you guys all know her from Clueless, saying that there shouldn't be a Black History Month or MLK Day if we want to be all together. That does not concern what's happening right now. We're going to leave that comment out in the gutter, right? Yeah. Because we appreciate this and we appreciate being able to do this every single day. I think it's important to pause to reflect on where we've come. Mm -hmm. um, I know that we've taken a few maybe step back, uh, step, you know, backwards, mm -hmm. um, the volatility that's going on here. But some of our guests that are going to be on the show today really want to highlight the progress Absolutely. that we've made, that they've made in their life. And I think one important thing, too, for this particular day to honor Dr. King is so many of us do that with a day of service, mm -hmm. going out and volunteering and, and trying to pay it forward. And I think that's one of the messages of this, of this day to celebrate. And don't you kind of think that the overall message is be a good person? There yes. you go good character and just be nice to people and be a good person. Mm -hmm. Be kind. Mm -hmm. I know. You're so optimistic, Lauren. Oh, I love that about thank you. you. But I do think that it is tough to be optimistic sometimes when you jump on social media and you see on your Facebook page like, oh my gosh, I've known this person for how many years? I didn't realize that they maybe have some views that yeah. the rants uh -huh. <laughs> people go on these rants, right? And I believe that we should always, I agree, we should always choose kindness. One of my favorite MLK quotes is injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. everywhere. Yes. There you and go. I try to think about this because my mom always taught me whether someone is a senator or a janitor, you treat them the same way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And no matter what makes someone a minority or makes them different. It could be their religion, mm -hmm. it could be the languages they speak, it could be their skin color, their sexual orientation, their disability status. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are so many reasons why we could put labels on people and single them out to treat them differently. And I just think we should be doing the opposite. I think yeah. we should yeah. embrace everyone and celebrate. Oh wow, like y you were raised a different way. I want I want to learn about your Absolutely. life. And just because you maybe have not experienced discrimination or maybe you haven't, you know, missed out on a job because of your race, gosh, I hope that we can be sympathetic to the struggles of other people and reach out and say, wow, this is not a problem for me, but I'm going to reach yes. out and help other people with whom I do not share the same life experience. Right. 
Right. Or I want to understand where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. Right. Not just saying it's not happening. Or yeah. post something nasty on social media. <laughs> right. We don't need that. That's what Dr. King was about. He was a pro-human being. He wanted everybody to get along, everybody to be treated the same, mm -hmm. everybody to have equal rights. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing right now. We're showing that and we are moving forward in that way. Every single day we can be making change, positive yes. change, and that's what he wants us to do. And that's what we're going to continue to do, especially on today. And we have to remember, too, that rate, you know, hate, let's just leave it at that, is a learned behavior. Mm -hmm. So that's coming from somewhere. So, so yep. we're, we're learning it, maybe end the cycle, right, and figure out how to get beyond that. Don't we all know what it feels like to be singled out in some way? Yeah, Lauren, absolutely. you're Jewish. Oh, you have shared yeah. stories with us about, you know, growing up. And, you know, a lot of people, that anti-Semitism is also still alive. You know, well. it's one of those things where you want to be really proud to wear a Star of David, but you're kind of hesitant at the same time just for other people around you and how they will take that in. You don't want to kind of put it out there, so to speak. You know what I'm really? saying? I mean, it's a lot less than it has been in the past, obviously, but there's still a little bit of that hesitation around sometimes, some people, some places that you're like, maybe I shouldn't be flaunting this out here right now. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Interesting. Yeah, well, so I it's think, still happening. Oh, I think you should be proud to wear the Star of Oh, David. absolutely. I think you should yeah. be proud of our heritage. Exactly. And where we came from. And again, I think that there are times when we all, as we move through the world, we mentioned being kind to people, mm -hmm. but I think that also it's important to call people out, but maybe with love, right? Mm -hmm. When you when you see something on social media that's maybe inflammatory, I've certainly had many uh, uh, borderline uncomfortable conversations oh. with people saying, hey, you know what, this thing that you posted, other people might take it f offense at this. Mm -hmm. And it also sort of highlights, you don't want to be that ignorant person on social media who's saying, this is not a problem in the world because, oh, well, I'm a white person. I went to public school. Public schools are fine. Well, an inner city kid who maybe is not a white child going to a school that maybe is overcrowded because of lack of funding mm -hmm. and I just think that a lot of people look through the lens of the world um, in a very in a very um, it's narrow I hate to say it's, blind way but mm -hmm. that's yeah. It yeah, is a narrow, really, yeah. exactly I need to right, open Joe. it wider and be able to experience everybody's experience because everybody has a different experience and you can learn from every single person's experience and it makes you a better person, it makes you more understanding, more knowledgeable, more caring, more sensitive mm -hmm. to all the different issues and topics that that person may be going through within their life. And that's what I want people to understand, especially on today. I mean, celebrating this day is just so special to me and my family. I mean, we have a huge party. It's a huge celebration because we celebrate his life. We celebrate his legacy and what he's done for the black community, but not just the black community, but for every single community. Right. He wanted everybody to get along, and that's what we want to continue doing. I have so many different ethnicities and races and cultures, backgrounds within my family, so I learn a little bit from each single person, Absolutely. and it makes us a family. It makes us together as one to continue loving and sharing that peace. Making that world go round. We are going to feel good today. We've got so many great segments coming up, and still to come, we're reflecting back on one of the history's greatest speeches and how it's still very relevant today. It absolutely is. Also, the life-changing impact of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. through the eyes of a TSU professor. Her perspective coming up right after the break. Well, the impact of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s struggle for racial equality in the United States still resonates today, and it's never taken for granted by a whole generation whose lives and opportunities drastically changed from the ones that their ancestors experienced. Here now with more on how her life has been shaped by Dr. King's dream, Dr. Karen Kasi Chernyshev, professor of history at Texas Southern University. Dr. Kasi Chernyshev, it is great to see you, meet you by Zoom. All right, so you were 11 days old when Martin Luther King Jr. gave his famous I Have a Dream speech. You were born in Houston's historic uh, St. Elizabeth's Hospital, and this was a segregated hospital. So tell us a little bit about your life growing up in Fifth Ward. Yes, well, actually, most of my life, uh, I grew up actually in not in the Fifth Ward area, but in an area that's called called Ryan's Edition, and then eventually in the Cynic Woods area. But everything started at St. Elizabeth's Hospital for Negroes. Of course, I had no clue that I was um, even there on that day. I had no clue that Dr. King was giving a speech. I was in. I, I, pre I presume that I was in my mother's loving arms 
um, you know, just 11 days old, you know, not even understanding the world around me. And this is why it's so important for us to to share history with our kids and with our with our families, because as I move forward, you know, I learned in school about Dr. King. And as um, a professional historian, I started to look back and realize how even my own life was so directly impacted by things that were developing that I had no clue about as a child, right? And so my educational background uh, reflects the impact of the civil rights movement on uh, my family, on my sisters and brothers, as we moved into a newly integrated neighborhood. The high schools that my brothers and sisters attended reflected the changes that were happening in the city of Houston. My elder brothers and sisters, some went to MB Smiley High School. The others of us went to Forest Brook High School. We watched our community change over, over time. Um, I graduated valedictorian of my high school class of 1981 and went on to Rice University, which in the 19, which was integrated in the 1960s. First, Dr. Raymond Johnson joined Rice as a graduate student, and eventually students um, started to come to Rice at in the 1970s. And I was among those who joined in 19 in the 1980s. And so my education there continued even through the PhD, where I learned um, through research. In fact, one of my historian friends said, well, Karen, I think you're the first African-American woman to earn a PhD in the field of history in the state of Texas. Um, and so when, when you start to see um, in, uh, these direct instances where you know your life is impacted by laws that were created before you were even aware that they were there there's a real um there's a real connection between the laws that we uh, that are on the books and then our lives um voting rights there's just so much that we can talk about you know, there are so many firsts that you have uh, in your resume. Of course, you've been at TSU for 27 years, you're a tenured professor for 15, um, and, and you talk about going to Rice and, and earning your PhD. Uh, you're also at Rice, the first African American um, for, um, we mentioned for the, um, to earn your uh, PhD in that same field, but how do you think your legacy, your place in history was shaped by this day, by the I Have a Dream speech. Have you ever thought about it that way? Well, absolutely. The, you know, we, so your guests before were talking about the dream, the importance of dreaming, of having a vision. And of course, I was inspired as a child by his speech. Uh, we were all taught to think about what we wanted to be as children. You know, I, the only thing I ever really said I wanted to be was a philanthropist. And I guess in, in some very important way, as an educator, I get to share knowledge all the time. But the, the hope that's inherent in the idea of dreaming and moving forward and thinking about positive ways that we want to impact the community. Let's talk a little bit more about your personal life today. Your husband, Dr. Oleg Chernyshev, he's an award-winning sleep specialist, naturalized American citizen as well. So it turns out your interracial marriage, look at this beautiful couple right here on your screen. So without the civil rights movement, Loving versus Virginia in 1968, it would not have been legal for you and your husband to have gotten married. Give us your thoughts on that and just where we are today in the world because while we have come a long way, and here's uh, your husband and your son we're seeing on the screen now, while we have come a long way, you've said that right now we really are at a crossroads. Yes, there. I, I, I'm honestly in some ways surprised by some of the, the rhetoric that, that I hear because as I was experiencing the the uh, fulfillment of so many dreams um, in my own life, it was it was a surprise to to see that there was a kind of a dissonance that was that was happening. Um, but those of us who have been impacted in a positive way by the social changes, social political changes, economic opportunity, educational opportunity, we know that there's there are a lot of positive things that have developed as a result of Dr. King's dream and the hope that was generated from that for so many. At the same time as a historian, I understand 
that when change occurs, there's always resistance to change. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have to take the time to understand why there are these continued pockets of resistance. And in addition to that, we also have to pay attention to um, why people are uh, being made to feel afraid. You know, what are they afraid about? And and we have to also take the time to try to educate and uh, and share with them the positive that we've seen develop in our country. And there's just so there's so there's overwhelming positive development as a result of Dr. King's dream. So much positive development for sure. But again, uh, we have about 30 seconds left, so not a lot to go into dive into detail here, but still lots of work to be done today. Exactly. Well, we love your optimism, uh, Dr. Karen Kasi Chernyshev. Thanks so much for spending time with us today Thanks. as we look back on the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely, we appreciate the insight. And to connect with Dr. Kazi Chernyshev, visit our website, HoustonLife.tv. Still to come, living history, how to share the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. with younger generations. Now let's send it over to Lauren, who got a chance to chat with a trailblazer in the Houston art scene. Hi, Lauren. Yeah, guys, I'm chatting with native Houstonian and former principal ballerina Lauren Anderson all about what helped inspire and mold her amazing career on stage and off. Houston Life will be right back. When you hear the name Lauren Anderson, two things immediately come to mind, ballet shoes and Houston icon. A native Houstonian, Lauren has been part of the Houston Ballet since 1983, and in 1990, she was one of the first African-American ballerinas to become a principal for a major dance company. She retired from the Houston Ballet in 2006, but that doesn't mean she slowed down one bit. I got to chat with Lauren all about her fascinating dance career, her inspirations, and even her favorite costumes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I am so excited to talk to you today. <laughs> You're excited about everything. Huh? I am most excited about you, though. Thank you for joining us, and I just, I, I'm so excited to spotlight your career because it has been magnificent. Thank you. I'm, uh, it's wonderful that we're here at the War, though, because this is where most of it happened. This is like your second home, That's right? That's right, for sure, for sure. How many years have you spent walking through those doors here at the Wortham? Well, the doors opened in 87. And I walked through the doors then. So let's see, 87 and what are we, 22? However many years that is, that's yep. how many years I've been walking through that's the doors. That's amazing. Lamar High School is where you went. That's right, right there on Westheimer. Represented. How old were you when you first started dancing? I started dancing at the age of seven, way back in 19 or huh? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I, I'll never forget, because I was in Houston Ballet's first Nutcracker down at Jones Hall down the street. And um, I didn't think that I was gonna be a ballerina. I think basically the way this happened is my dad uh, was an assistant principal of high school for the performing arts, and he was hiring dance teachers and hired, was hiring pianists and dance teachers from Houston Ballet and said, I have an overactive uh, young daughter. Is ballet good? Oh. <laughs> and he's right, I'm still overactive. Yeah. Not young anymore, but, and ballet was definitely good for me. Absolutely. Yeah. Since the Wortham opened, you've been here, 1990 was a big year for you. Let's talk about that year specifically. So in 1990, I became the first black principal dancer with the Houston Ballet. That was huge. I had no idea that was going to happen. My dream was to get in the company. So I got in in 1983 after I graduated from high school. And then my goal was to be a soloist because I wanted to be the chick in the middle in the tutu. Who the doesn't want to yeah, do that? The yes, Sugar Plum Fairy. Yes, yes. I mean, I've been watching her since I was seven. And then uh, the most amazing thing happened when Ben Stevenson said, you know, next year we're going to make you a principal dancer. And I literally, I tried to be cool, but you know, I was going, wee -hee! and I was like, Oh my goodness, thank you so much. And I was jumping up and down and doing one of these on the inside. Yeah, absolutely. It was amazing. I had no idea. And then, you know, uh, you, ne you think you're going to dance forever when you're young. And you have no idea that, I mean, he set me up for success again because I started teaching uh, in 1987, actually, in the school, just here and there. And that's what I do now. That's what I'd love to do. My, my, my jam is teaching students, introducing them to dance, introducing them to the theater, uh, teaching ballet to conservatory schools, yeah. Did Dr. King have a, of an inspirational role in your career? Well, yeah, 
I, I will say, I, I will not misquote Dr. King, I won't, but he mentioned content of character, and that has stood out for me. Um, I know with all the stuff that's going on now, what necessary, unnecessary, all the many things, we can't forget about the content of character. We're thinking about the color of the skin and the gender and the age and the whatever. None of that matters. Content of character is most important. And I think we lose that with social media, right? We have content, but not much character. Mm, I preached. Mm. I just preached. <laughs> true inspiration to so many people. For more on my fun chat with Lauren, just log on to HoustonLife.tv. Derek and Courtney, let me tell you something. She was one of the most fun, charismatic people I have ever spoken to and just a blast. Her career is still going so strong and mm -hmm. it was amazing to talk to her and how much love she has for ballet. She says ballet is her first love than her husband <laughs> and then her son. <laughs> Listen, I want to go to Lauren Anderson's church any day. Absolutely. She is fantastic. And I love that now she is in, in the school, in the academy, because yes. now young girls have someone that they can look up to yep. that look like them. Absolutely. She is a, such a role model, model in the community. She's on so many boards around town. Yeah. She just has a, a packed schedule, and she's a busy lady, so we're just so glad she took the time She's to also an approachable, real person. Yes. Yes. And one of yes. the things, one of the many things I love about you, Lauren, she's been very open about her ups and downs yep. in Struggles. her career and in life. Yep. And I think that is to be commended. Truly an inspiration that cannot be overstated. Can we yeah. also talk about the gun? Oh, her arm. Arms are spectacular. Amazing yeah. girlfriend. <laughs> Amazing. Again, I want to go to your church anytime. <laughs> Preach. Thanks, Lauren. <laughs> Thank sure. you, Lauren. Okay, still to come on Houston Life, we're going to get a check of what's coming up on the news at 4 o'clock, including your afternoon forecast. And Joe is standing by for a look at a local history story. Hey, Joe. Hey, guys. Yeah, speaking of church and preaching, how Houston's first black missionary Baptist church came to be and continues to serve as a beacon of light for the community, Houston Life will be back in just two minutes. Good afternoon, I'm Keith Garvin. And I'm Andy Sirota, Houston Life will be right back, but first a look at what we are working on for our newscast at four o'clock. It's safe to get your COVID and flu vaccines at the same time, and one day soon you may be able to get them in one shot. We're gonna lay out the new details from Moderna on a combined coronavirus flu booster shot and when we could see it roll out to the general public. Plus, millions of Americans live with diabetes, but they're missing a critical step that could also help them avoid developing heart problems. The new warning from doctors that everyone should listen to. And as the nation pauses to honor Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., people around the nation call for changes to voting laws. Lawmakers on Capitol Hill are pushing for changes that they say will help bring the nation closer to the civil rights icon's dream, the voting bill at the center of a furious political battle. Cold start in the 30s this morning, but temperatures have climbed quickly. Let's check in with Chief Meteorologist Frank Billingsley to see yeah. how long we can expect this beautiful weather. You know, a couple of days and then things change, but we're about 12 degrees warmer today than we were this time yesterday. Right there, the mid and the upper 60s, a lot of blue sky, beautiful for the parade today. It's going to be a lovely evening. In fact, perfect for Freckles and his dog walk. 68 at 4 and 5, 66 at 6, 61 at 7. There are low water advisories through 6 o'clock just because of this north wind that we have had pushing some of that water out. So we're watching for that. But a beautiful full moon tonight. Tuesday is going to be even warmer than today and Wednesday even warmer before a cold front gets here. We'll talk about that at four, but you can see 76 for Tuesday and then 78 on Wednesday. This front comes through. There is some chance of perhaps a little wintry mix in spots. We'll detail that. That would be for Thursday. Check out my blog. Click to Houston.com slash weather 2022's first full moon crying wolf. It's called the wolf moon, but is it really? We'll have your full forecast at four. Welcome back. Throughout the show today, we've been honoring the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and how we can still learn from his words and his actions. Founder of Texas Center for African American Living History, Naomi Mitchell Carrier is joining us now by Zoom to share her perspective. Naomi, thanks so much for your time today. 
My pleasure. It is great to see you. Let's talk a little bit about you before we get into tips to help our young people understand the significance of the life and le legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. You're also an author and playwright. You wrote and composed the renowned historical musical, I Am Annie Mae. So you have a deep connection to black history here in Houston. Here in Houston, here in Texas my home state. So talk to us about this Texas Center for African American Living History. What does the center do and why did you found it back in 1998? I know there was a name change in 2007. We founded our company uh, to secure the mission of documenting, researching, interpreting, and preserving African American history in Texas from an African American perspective. And uh, most of my work has been centered around uh, getting the archive information from various historic sites like Brazoria County Historical Museum, Sam Houston Museum, and using that documented information to turn it into living history theater that we have reenacted. So my book, Go Down Old Hannah, The Living History of African American Texans, spotlights 15 of those reenactments. That is incredible. They, they concentrate on celebrations, running away, civil war, reconstruction. We tried to cover the history of African American Texans in those various periods. And Naomi, we're lucky that there are so many firsthand accounts out there of the civil rights movement, of segregation, integration that happened in the 1960s. Let's talk about today and our young people because it seems like, um, you know, unless you lived through something personal, sometimes it's more difficult to translate a message to younger people. So how do we talk to our young people about the significance of MLK Day? The significance of MLK Day is synonymous with the importance of voting rights in a democracy, and we're facing a crisis about that today. I like to talk to young people about some of my personal experiences. For example, on April 4th, 1968, I was a senior student at the University of North Texas. It was a spring evening, and those of us who had formed the first and only African-American organization on that campus this. We're headed to our weekly meeting only to learn that at 6.05 p.m. on Thursday, April 4th, 1968, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was shot dead while standing on a balcony outside his second floor room at the Lorraine Motel in Memphis, Tennessee. So what did we do? The next day on Friday morning, our officers secured an appointment with the university president and requested that classes be canceled on Monday, April the 8th, in honor of our fallen hero. The request was granted. There was no outbreak of violence, just peaceful demonstrations of sadness and disappointment for which we were shown some respect. I'm not sure we would have that same amount of respect today. This is 2022. Wow, well, that's an incredible uh, recounting of the events of that day. As a music teacher, and before that, I was the church musician. I grew up playing patriotic songs in public audiences, and God Bless America was and still is my favorite song. My, my prayers for our democracy are daily. They are continually in my mouth. I pray for the country. I ask God to bless America. To bless our president, President Biden, given the cards he was was given when he became president, he does need our prayers. I learned that right was better than wrong and truth is better than lies. I grew up knowing this and it's still true. So to stand complacently by and watch the death of democracy of the greatest country on earth, we have to heal our country. That is the fierce urgency of now. My favorite quote by Dr. Martin Luther King. And I will finally say that healing begins with reparations. I was given this brick in 2008 by a white woman who apologized to me for slavery by saying, Naomi, I am sorry for what my people did to your people. I began to cry. She began to cry. 
Everybody in the room began to cry. And I learned from that moment that the healing of trauma can only begin with some reparations and some apologies. And so I offer that to young people who want to know, what should we do about America's uncomfortable history? We need to apologize for that. We need to come to grips with that. We need to learn what it was. We need to repair. We need to heal. And we need to love. That is the significance of this day, to heal our country in a democratic way, the same way that Martin Luther King did. He was the recipient of the Nobel Prize for Peace. I pray for peace. Very well said. Well, these are pretty impactful quotes here. The time is always right to do what is right. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Uh, one of my favorites, Injustice Anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Naomi Mitchell Carrier, thanks so much for your time and for your perspective as well. It has been my pleasure. For more information or to connect with Naomi, you can visit the scene on Houston Life section of our website, HoustonLife.tv. And from looking to the future to remembering the past, Joe Sam is here with more on the first black church in Houston. Hi, Joe. Hey, Derek. Yeah, on June 19th, 1865, known today as Juneteenth, slaves were finally freed in Texas. Not long after, a small group of freed slaves came together to organize the first African-American Baptist church in Houston. I had the great privilege to talk with its current pastor to find out just how special the Antioch Missionary Baptist Church is to the city of Houston. This church is significant in black history in that it was founded by ex-slaves. Now, what's really interesting is that it was only seven months after Emancipation uh, Proclamation was received here um, in June 19th, uh, two years later, that seven months after we got the news, those gentlemen, those people established that church just seven months after that. As I was looking around and seeing the church, there's four significant people that are in some of those beautiful windows. Yes. Tell us about those people. These people were the original founder, uh, our, our pastor, Jack Yates. Those men represent Antioch's first four pastors of the church, and they have been there as a symbol of hope and just uh, an idea of where we started. These pews were made by ex-slaves and are designed specifically for the sanctuary. What do you think the church does for people who are going there, knowing that rich history that it brings to this area? I think it does for people today as it did people of yesteryear. Uh, that church served as a beacon of light for the people in the area then as it does today. You know, Joe, uh, Antioch just celebrated its 155th anniversary. Wow. This city is 183 years old. So that, that says how deeply rooted this church is into this city. What do you want people to walk away once they finally leave the church on any given Sunday or any given day that you guys are doing sermons? Yes, our message to, to, to the people of this city and those of them who are following us on social media is a message of hope in that we have been solid in this city, we have been solid in our ministry, in, in that little small patch of grass uh, that we have established 155 years ago is still doing the same things it did then. We're educating, uh, we've got social uh, programs going on, we're feeding the homeless and clothing the poor. So it's those same things, that, and we invite all people to come down and worship and be a part of the ministry that we have at Antioch. The Antioch Missionary Baptist Church will be celebrating their 156th anniversary this Sunday on the 23rd, starting off at 1030. I'll have a link on our website, HoustonLife.tv, where you can learn more about that special service and the church's rich history. This is really great to have this here, right downtown Houston. Mm. So much history, and the things that we talk about with Dr. Martin Luther King, they have the same goals and ambitions and mission that they have set in place there at the church, feeding the community, making sure that the homeless are taken care of, 
and educating the community about African Americans and the work that they've done there to build that church. Over a hundred years of service, mm -hmm. it's really fantastic. I've been to that church before, didn't realize all the significant little details there that you shared in the piece. It was lovely. Absolutely. Thank Very you, nice guys. Mm -hmm. And happy 155th anniversary as well. That's really cool. After the break, pastors Rudy and Juanita Rasmus are getting ready to, in the studio to share why Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream is as important today as it was 58 years ago during the March on Washington. Stay right here. We'll be right back. Well, welcome back. You know, Dr. King led the civil rights movement in America, and no doubt his most compelling speech was, of course, the I Have a Dream speech, which illuminated the power of having a dream that is worthy of the dreamer. Here with more on why it continues to be relevant and how it applies to us today are pastors Rudy and Juanita Rasmus. Welcome to both of you, Thank my you. friends. It's Thank great you. to see you in person. I know, I know. <laughs> Not only the power couple, but the power pastors, of course, at St. John's downtown. It is so lovely. I literally could just sit here and listen to both of you, but this is such a great day to, for everyone to really take something from that speech, the I Had a Dream, because you know, at, at some point, in our lives, we're all dreaming of something. We ought to be. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And Pastor Rudy, why do you think that that is so important today? You know, today um, we have in many cases uh, lost the, uh, the, the will to dream. You know, but it's in us. It's, mm -hmm. it's in each and every one of us. And, and Dr. King knew that. You know, you know it's interesting. Dr. King had um, been, been doing his dream speech around, uh, but hadn't planned to do it in Washington that day. Okay was getting ready to, to talk, and as he started speaking, he wasn't doing his dream speech. Mahalia Jackson, who had just finished singing, looked over and said, Martin, tell him about the dream. That is really fantastic, and I think what's so great, and you, you hit on something too, and I think Juanita, you probably, you and I chatted a little bit during the commercial break. I think at some point, you know, our kids, we label them as dreamers. What do you want to be? What do you want to dream about? And, and that's okay, but as an adult to be labeled a dreamer, somehow that's negative. We need to really do the paradigm shift here absolutely. or get rid of that. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And it's important to keep that light on. It is, because the reality is, each of us has innately within us some way we're being invited into the world to serve, to show up, to be present. And so when we don't nurture that dream in us, the world suffers a little bit. And right now our world is suffering a bit, isn't it? It is. Absolutely. And I think there's so much to take from when we rewind history, when we look back at the pages, whether it's movies from that time or it's just, you know, a video recounting that speech it is so relevant today i feel like you know in times we've we've come so far but yet we've done major steps backwards too how do we reunite this is a big question <laughs> how do we I get feel it right <laughs> how do we reunite yeah. just even you know not the world but maybe just our community because i feel like even our communities are at odds yeah i agree what do you think? I, th I think the uh, first thing is to um acknowledge the uh the humanity in each and every one of us and, uh, and and really the the life that each of us you know bring bring to the to the conversation to the journey uh, is also should be connected to a dream as well. Mm -hmm. You know something that we can't do or haven't done yet but know that ultimately we want to do. It's interesting because we talk about vision boards, we talk about writing a list or things that we want to accomplish, but yet we change it from dream to vision to these other things and we just need to maybe just keep it a dream. That's right, that's right. You know, there's such power in a dream. First of all, life comes out of a dream. There are five check marks mm -hmm. for whether or not your dream is worthy of you. See, each of us is worthy of a dream because dream is innately who we are as human beings. We're all called to be dreamers. But number one, you've got to make sure that the dream is something you love because you're gonna be exchanging some of the capital of your life for that dream, right? The second thing is making sure it relates and it lines up with your core values, who you are and how you wanna show up in the world. Thirdly, it's gotta invite you to grow, mm -hmm. all right? It's not a redo if it's not inviting you to grow. And then fourthly, there's got to be this sense that I can't do this alone. I'm gonna need the help of my higher power, however you might choose to name that higher power. Then the next thing is it's got 
to be good in it inherently for others. That's when you know that you're lining up with a dream that's worthy of you investing your time, your talent, your resources, and your life in it. Mm. Okay. It's got to be some you love. It, it really does, and that could be anything. It and could I, I'm be. I'm listening to you, Juanita, because the, the five points, and I think to this, I have a 14-year-old, a 10-year-old, I have all the struggles that every family has Absolutely. out there. Husband and I, we're going in 10 different directions. <laughs> but my goodness, this is a family dinner conversation. Absolutely, To talk about is. how do we achieve these things? Yes. How do we become better in this yes. world? And the two of you really do that. You never forget the community that you're in, that you grew up in, Thank that you. you've been here for so many years, and you continue to see the need and how that grows inside of you, which I think is really important. And I'm talking about through good coffee and, of course, the pastoring and everything that you do, but it has to boil down to kind of that humility, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the reality is, and Rudy and I talk about this all the time, and, and this is something that's so powerful about Dr. Yeah. King's dream, okay? Dr. King did not have a dream. I know somebody's saying, what? The dream had mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. That dream had him. And when you have a dream that, that has you, it compels you to become a certain kind of person. Mm -hmm. It compels you. It moves you forward. Pain pushes. Right. But a good dream, it draws you. Yeah. Like a book. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that is so true. Pastor Rudy, I, you know, when you think about today, MLK Day, the power behind the significance, the statues, everything that we're seeing on screen now, and what that means to you, but I, I really think it's what it should mean to our community, because everybody can gain from those words. Yeah, you know, I was about eight years old when Dr. King came to Houston, and um, and I remember being in the Coliseum. It's no longer there. I think the Hobby Center is there. Right. <laughs> and um, and. But I also remember the uh, the awe that the uh, the, the crowd had, mm -hmm. and, and how uh, when we left that place, I never I never stopped thinking about what he said that day, that night, and ultimately what he represented for the rest of our lives. Mm -hmm. It's been a great journey. It has been a great journey. A little disappointing now, I think, maybe with just the, the yeah. volatility of what's in the world exactly. today. Um, but I guess, as you were saying, Juanita, if it doesn't affect us, we can't grow. That's right. And you know, the other thing, I think what's, what we're being invited to notice about this volatility mm -hmm. and this very low energy, this fear-driven energy, this anxiety-based energy, is that we're being invited to grow up, to spiral up into something good and something powerful mm -hmm. and something profound. But it's got to start, Courtney, with each individual person saying, what would I love? What would I love as it relates to my relationship? in my community? What would I love as it relates to time and money, freedom? Who would I love to be generous to and with? What would I love in terms of my health and well-being? What would I love in terms of the way I show up and serve the world as my vocation, mm -hmm. right? When we operate out of what we love, it is the highest source of light and life and when I'm coming out of love, and you're coming out of love, and you're coming out of love, we can't help but have what? More of the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good things happen. Good things. Oh, power couple, power pastors, <laughs> authors, do-gooders. It's lovely to see you. So good, good to, to be you. with Can you. Can I just call you every morning yes. and you can tell me some good <laughs> yes, things? absolutely. Give me some good vibes I have every morning. I meditation on my <laughs> voicemail, so call and invite okay. you to breathe. I'm going to do that. Listen, my friends, it's yeah. always great to catch up with you. And More likewise. importantly, on this day today, it's, it's very special to have this conversation. Good. We appreciate both of you. you. Thank you. And to keep up with Pastor Pastor Rudy and Pastor Juanita, visit our website, HoustonLife.tv. You won't be disappointed. After the break, a look at what's coming up on tomorrow's show, including a lesson in a popular winter Olympic sport. Houston Life is right back. Coming up tomorrow on Houston Life, get those mason jars ready. We are showing you the simple way to pickle any vegetable at home. Oh, I love that. And before the Winter Olympics get started next month, we're learning all about the sport, the popular sport of curling. The Curling Club of Houston 
is breaking down what makes this ice sport so much fun. My Listen, goodness. this was uh, curling is a cult following. Did you remember in the Salt Lake City Olympics in yes. 2002, curling and all these people were like recreating with brooms and mops at home? It's There is such a science behind it. It's fascinating. It really is fantastic. Can't wait for that. What a fun show today. And I love, it's also inspiring, I think is the better word that I wanted to leave with today. Pastors Rudy and Juanita, they are such a powerful duo. Grandparents, they showed us uh, photos of their oh, grandbabies. Yes. Yes. Two, almost two years old and four years old. But I always love hearing other people's experiences, right? I mean, they're obviously icons here in the community, but it was great hearing from our professor whose marriage would have been considered illegal mm -hmm. back in the day before interracial marriage was the law of the land. The, I think the theme for today is to feel good, do good, let that light shine and pass along some kindness. Yeah, and reach out to others uh, with different experiences, with kindness and with friendship as well. Thanks so much for joining us today as we have looked back on the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It's been an honor to do so. We will see you tomorrow and the news at four is next.